I'm Dr. Michael Latola. And I'm Megan Strong. I sit down with a dentist with some shady remakes and find out what's going on. And I'll let you know why men in West Virginia are excited about this water crisis. And dental problems are just one more issue with orcas in captivity. That and more on today's Chairside Live. Hello and welcome to episode 83 of Chairside Live. Megan, how are you today? I'm doing well. I'm a little um, upset because I have become one of those moms. Uh oh. And I will tell you. I didn't know you were a mother. I'm not. Okay. Of a human, but I am of a furry animal, Parker. All right. Parker. I talk about him way too much on the show. Um, and I always thought it was hilarious when people take their dog to daycare. Doggy mm -hmm. daycare. Really? Mm -hmm. Come on. You throw him in the backyard, please. Um, but I've become one of those furry mothers and I take my dog Parker to daycare but it's because our friend owns the place and my husband has a uh, clothing company and a t-shirt screening company so he makes shirts for them and then Parker goes there and he plays with his friends. Oh so you're bartering kind of for Basically. The, right okay so he goes there and hangs out with other dogs. And yeah and then he I mean he doesn't go every day but he'll go and he'll play with all the dogs and then they'll bathe him and you know give him haircuts whatever and then he comes home exhausted. <laughs> and goes which right, is goes right to sleep. That's a, the best kind of a dog is a sleeping dog but um, yeah so. Do they have that do they have that nanny cam where I'm you can see your lie, dogs? Yes. Okay but didn't you show me that once? Didn't you show me like footage so. of Parker somewhere? Is that where he was? Probably that was where it was. Right, yeah. okay. Yeah, I have I think a lot of videos of Parker. <laughs> a lot of, <laughs> a lot of dogs problem. fraternizing together, yes. but otherwise look like a fantastic facility. Well, we've got a great case of the week for you this week. I just recently spent time with a dentist who had 40% remakes on his crown and bridge, and that was just from shade alone. That didn't even take into account the fit issues and the other things. And so we started to dig a little deeper into his account and see what was going wrong. And as I talked to him, part of the problem was just the shade guides he was using. And so we made some changes in his practice and things are going a lot better now. So for the case of the week, I just wanted to spend a little time with you talking about the different shade taking systems and the one that I really prefer and that we prefer here at the lab and I know you'll get better results with. So let's go ahead and take a look at that now. As I look at this uh, picture here of the Vita Classic Shade Guide in the color space, it makes me feel a lot better about the way I struggled to take shades over the years. You can see B1 completely outside of the color space there on the upper left because it's not a color that actually occurs uh, in nature. And then D4 is way out of the color space down there on the, on the lower left. And it looks like when you look at those uh, tooth images that you just took a handful of like fingernails and then threw them out like you were shooting craps and they just kind of randomly splay out there. And if you compare that and contrast it with what you see when you take a look at the VD, Vita 3D Master System, look at that. You've got equal spacing from left to right and equal spacing from top to bottom between those different shade families. The 1M1, the 2M1, 3M1. All of those shades are scientifically laid out within that color space. The Vita Classic Shade System was based on prevalent uh, denture tooth shades in Germany in the uh, 1950s. And you can see the OM1-3 shades are up out of the shades, uh, out of the typical color space because they don't exist in nature. Those are bleach shades and you don't see those naturally occurring, but certainly after somebody bleaches their teeth, you might have the need for that. And so this equal spacing, uh, especially the vertical equal spacing allows for half shades. So if a dentist finds something that's a lower value than a 1M1, but a higher value than a 2M1, for example, we can actually uh, match a shade in the middle. What you'll notice when you start to use these shade tabs are that the Vita 3D Master shade tabs just match natural teeth better. And so I'm happy to say that here at Glidewell now 20%, a full 20% of our shades are these Vita 3D Master shades and that comes from about 2% when I started here 12 years ago. So I'm glad to see that on the rise. And if we look at a regular um, Vita Classic shade guide, most of us were taught in dental school to arrange it by value. And so obviously when it comes uh, right out of the box, it's uh, kind of worthless the way it's set up because it's just kind of set up uh, alphabetically. And uh, this is one that's been arranged by value, but you've probably seen us do this before. If we make this black and white, there's certain things that jump out like A2 uh, is actually higher in value than D2. And this is actually arranged by value um, according to the directions that are right in with the Vita Classic Shade Guide. So Vita actually will be the first to tell you that, hey, you know what, these colors, uh, they aren't the most scientific, you know, when it comes to matching natural teeth. 
Unfortunately, it just happens to be the um, language that we all speak in terms of color and dentistry, and they continue to do so in dental school today. But there's no doubt uh, when you see the Vita 3D Master shade uh, tabs in the mouth that they definitely match natural teeth better. And they give not only our technicians, but all dental technicians a better chance of matching uh, a crown to an adjacent natural tooth when you use those shades. So the next thing I want to show you is a survey. Now this, this says it's a study that we did on over 2 million crowns. And that's true, but we've now re-verified it, and it's now been proven on over 4 million, 4 million crowns that have come through the laboratory here, that this is the distribution of the most requested shade. So certainly the most popular shade is A2, and the reason why A2 is so popular is that in the Vita Classic Shade Guide, A2 is a huge bucket that encompasses uh, about three to five other 3D master shades, and that's the reason it's so popular. Um, when you use something like a Vita Easy Shade Compact, the digital shade taking unit, you'll notice that uh, uh, I've seen that when I get an A2 reading, it'll give you the 3D reading at the same time, and oftentimes it'll break it down even further. So A2 is very popular, but it's not very accurate when it comes to shades. It's way more accurate with the 3D system. A3, you can see, is the second most popular shade than A1. Then B1, that's probably a mistake, uh, because B1 happens to be the most remade shade in our laboratory as well. It's 4% of the requests that we get, and it's 11% of the remakes that we do. So B1 is the most remade shade in our laboratory. Right next to it, A3.5, that is the least remade shade in our laboratory. I love that shade for any posterior tooth for anybody over the age of 40. Then D2, D3, C2, C3, C1, B2, A4. And then finally, in about 11th position, we see 2M2 and 2M1. Uh, and that's just because, as I mentioned, it's now about 20% uh, of the prescriptions that we see coming in with the 3D master shades. Hopefully, those will continue to move up. But if I say what's the most popular shade to a room full of 200 doctors, almost all of them will either say A2 or A1. They'll say one of those two and they'll say it very loudly. Never do you hear a voice from the back of the room say 2M1, you know, the, the 3D equivalent of A2, because unfortunately it's not the language that we speak. Now, I've got a good friend who's a dentist who sends a lot of work here to the lab, and he's got a remake rate of 8% for shade alone. That doesn't even take into account fit and things like that. Shade alone is 8%. So here's what I've had him do. I've had him take his Vita Shade Guide and take it from the one that I showed you earlier, where it's arranged according to value. And I've had him and many other doctors who I've consulted with on the phone about their shade remakes switch it to the most likely or the most popular shades in America based on those 4 million crowns. So again, just like that graph, it's A2, A3, then A1, then B1, which probably shouldn't be in there, but we let the patients see it too often. And like moths to a flame, they see that white and they're like, oh, must have white tooth. And you're like, you know, it looks way better as a shade tab than it does as a crown. Because here it looks decent as a shade tab, but B1 crowns, woof. They are dogs. They don't match a lot. But patients just can't help themselves. They want all their teeth to look like that, not just the one crown you're doing. So that one should probably be gone, but A2, A3, A1, B1, A3.5, D2, D3. This is the likelihood that any shade that you're taking on a tooth, this is the most likely shade and this is the least likely shade. So this will be happening a good 30 to 40% of the time. And this uh, should not be happening very often. D4, you know that term they have for like, um, well, in Calgary recently, last year, they had a bunch of floods and they called it a 100-year flood. This is a 100-year shade. You literally should be prescribing this once every 100 years. So if your grandfather was a dentist and your father was a dentist and now you're a dentist, between the three of you in your entire careers, this should have been prescribed once. It's that much of an event. I would invite the local news over. I would celebrate it with the patient, consider having a parade maybe down the main street of your town. This is not going to happen very often. If you're doing this more than once, um, it's the wrong shade. I can just, I can just guarantee it. Uh, the chances are it's, it's going to be this, 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 and then in decreasing likelihood as you work your way over. And we've seen a lot of dentists lower their shade remake by doing this. But really the best advice I can give them is just to switch over to what Vita now recommends. And that is their 3D master linear guide or value guide. And this is the one that I use and that I love. And so obviously it's a little bigger than a regular Vita shade guide, but as you'll see the shade guides themselves, 
aren't any bigger. It's just in this nice little package. And one of the difficult things about using the conventional shade guide is that we have to measure value, hue, and chroma all at the same time. In reality, 80, 85% of the job is getting the value correct, but we've got all these other colors in here too, and even when they're lined up by value, it's a little difficult to do. So Vita's really made it simple for us with the value guide. This is the value guide of the part of this 3D master system here. And you can see it's pretty simple. We've got six different value families to choose from. So the step one is just to have you or your assistant, and if your assistant is a 30-year-old female, she's probably got great vision. You know, why not let her do this? It's pretty easy. This isn't technical dental knowledge. This is hold this up to the tooth we're trying to match and see which one matches. Really, no dental knowledge helps here. In fact, in fact, you might be more unbiased if you don't have any dental knowledge. So that, that might be a way to go. And when you look at this, you can see our bleach family here, uh, the zero or the O, OM2 or zero M2 and the five, you know, these are kind of the outliers as is the four. Even the three is not that frequent. Uh, most of what you're gonna do is gonna be in the one to two with a few threes thrown in. Maybe a zero if the patient's bleached or you're matching a bleach restoration. And the four and the five aren't gonna happen that much. But as you might be able to see, it's, it's pretty simple here because instead of trying to match everything all at once, all we wanna do is hold this next to the natural tooth and see where it falls in terms of value, in terms of how light it is on the white to black scale. And obviously there's a pretty big difference. These two are the closest, but that's part of that's because of the camera light. It's a little easier under the lip. And if I get it you know, in a little bit of shadow, you can see that it's darker. As you go in and hold these into the mouth, if you get this part correct, you're 80% of the way there. And so if you put it in there and go, yep, yeah, it looks like that 1M2 is the closest value family one, then you move up to the Hue Chroma Shade Guides over here. So if you've selected a one, we pull this over and then you'll notice there's two shades here, the 1M2 and the 1M1. So it's just a choice between these two. And so now all we're talking about is shift in the red-yellow spectrum here once we've nailed down the value family that we're looking for. Or let's say that you use the value guide and decided, or you, you and your assistant together, uh, decided that it was a two, that it was from the two family. Again, that's 80% of the job. Um, almost any of these shades that I'm about to show you in the two family shade guide are going to look good in the patient's mouth because they're relatively uh, subtle differences between the two. Because we've gotten the value correct, and now we're just trying to get the hue and the chroma here, but you can see you know, a little more yellow as you shift back and forth and a little more brown. But you can probably tell, and I've proven this with CAD CAM restorations where we'll make restorations and uh, we'll get the value family right and then make restorations out of all these different shades and they all look good in the mouth. You put them in, you go, you know what? 90% of dentists would put any one of these in. But this helps you kind of dial this in as you shift from the M, the more neutral, to the L's and the R's and work your way back and forth through here. So once you've identified it as a two, again, you're 80, 85% of the way here. Hold this one in and go back and forth and see which one of these is the closest. If you can't decide, you can take two of them out, for example, and then hold them both by the tooth that you're trying to match. You hold them or your assistant holds them while the other one takes a picture. And so you have them both in there. Just be sure you don't cover, obviously, like the names of the shade tabs you know, with your thumb. And so even if a material we're making a crown out of doesn't come in a 3D shade, let's say I choose a 2M1 and I'm going to have something like an Emax crown done and it doesn't come in a 2M1, we're still better off working with that because our technicians will go, oh, 2M1, uh, that roughly converts to an A2 in the Vita Classic Shade Guide. So they'll get an Emax block and they'll mill it out of A2, but then when it comes time to characterize it at the end, they're going to grab the 2M1 that you gave them a photograph of in the mouth next to the tooth. And that's what they're gonna to use to characterize uh, that Emax crown in the final stages. So even though it's an A2 base shade of the crown itself, they're gonna characterize it using the shade tab. And if in your picture, you know, next to the natural tooth that we're trying to match, they look at it and they go, oh, the 2M1's a little higher in value. Now when they're making the crown, when they put this next to the crown, they'll make sure that this is a little higher in value uh, than the crown itself. So even if the material that you're prescribing for the restoration doesn't come in the Vita 3D shades, it's still more helpful to use this. Remember, anytime you take a shade picture, make sure there's a shade tab in. Taking, you know, telling us that it's an A2 and then taking a picture of the tooth by itself, uh, because of the variation of uh, colors on people's displays, yours versus ours, 
it's very difficult to really make that meaningful unless there's a shade tab in place. So any uh, picture concerning shade needs to have a shade tab in place, even if it was in left field. You know, even if uh, for some reason you chose, I don't know, like a 4M2 and it was clearly not the right shade, but somehow that's the picture that got sent. At least the t technician could go, whoa, look how dark that is compared to the natural tooth we're matching it to. And when they put that, the crown next to it as they're doing the final characterization, they could try to get that same kind of difference between this being so much darker than the crown they're working on. So the bottom line is if you're in the market for a new shade guide, and if it's been more uh, than 12 to 18 months since you have one, you've probably been putting your old Vita Classic guide into the cold sterile. And as you do that, the glutaraldehyde will eat the glaze away at these shade tabs and the value of all of these shade tabs will rise, giving you some uh, inaccurate shades. The good news is um, all of these shade tabs, well, including the new Vita Classic ones, these can all go in the heat sterilizer and should go in the heat sterilizer. There's no damage done to any of these when they go in the autoclave. The only way to damage these is to put them in cold sterile, which eats away the glaze on the teeth. But if you're considering getting a new shade guide you're at that time, I want you to think long and hard about getting um, uh, the linear guide because when you use the value guide to narrow it into which value family, family it is, and then you pull out the associated uh, hue and chroma guide, it's really gonna dial it in for you. I realize it's two steps as opposed to the old fashioned one step that we've been doing, but I'd rather do two uh, very accurate steps or easier steps to get an accurate result. Now let's go to a segment we call the YouTube Comment of the Week. This comment came to us on YouTube from Dr. Heidelberg Cruz, which reminds me of Breaking Bad, favorite show, not finished, no spoiler alerts. And he commented and he said, Dr. Detola changed the way I practice dentistry. He's my dentistry hero. Thanks, Doc. Wow, that was it? That's it. What was it in response to? The uh, prep and no prep comprehensive porcelain veneer techniques uh, video. Uh, you know, actually, that, that, um, that probably needs to be updated, that video. Probably. I'm glad uh, you liked it, Heidelberg. Um, it's really, it doesn't really have any Emacs veneers on there. It was produced before we were doing Emacs hmm. veneers. Um, we were doing no prep, minimal prep veneers, but um, good example is Jim Gladwell, man who owns and gives his name to this company. Mm -hmm. We did some of those um, no prep, minimal, barely prep veneers on him, and he broke uh, four of the eight, or chipped four of the eight within six or seven months. Oof. And apparently it's stressful to own a large dental laboratory. You think? And um, he's just one of those people who, um, because of the way his teeth contact is, he goes into, uh, into protrusive. Mm -hmm. um, if there's any interference or we're riding on there at all, we might get some breakage. Those came off and were replaced with Emacs veneers, and he hasn't had a single fracture since. And it's been years now because nice. the Emacs veneers are three times as strong as what we were using mm -hmm. in that video. Um, at the time, you know, that was kind of state of the art in sure. terms of aesthetics uh, and strength. But now with Emacs, we've got something three times uh, as strong we can use in that place. Again, he hasn't broken anything. He thought at one point that he had chipped one of the veneers and he mm -hmm. came and he said, oh, I'm sorry, doc. I think, uh, I, think I have your first Emacs veneer chip. And he, he, as we looked at it, um, we realized that it wasn't the upper, it was actually the lower tooth that had chipped where this Ooh. little piece had come off. And so it had not chipped the veneer, but it had chip the real tooth across from it and that's what I that's what I'm looking for in a material for sure I want something that when stressed it breaks the real other tooth. Things. not the one that I right. worked on I wanted to break the other tooth then there I can go. tell the patient what's wrong with you what have you been chewing Chuck Norris of you teeth, broke the you real tooth you couldn't break the one that we made because right. it was way too strong so most of those cases now are going to be done in Emacs press the press version the stronger version we can also do no prep veneers uh, in Emacs now and for any of those cases it's really going to work out a lot better if you send us a study model for us to do a, either just an evaluation or an evaluation and a diagnostic wax up. I oftentimes will look at a case and kind of have one idea about it and then I'll bring it to my the technician I work with most here, Cindy. She'll take a look at the model and she'll go, you know what, if you give me a little reduction here, here, and here, this case can turn out really nice. And I'll say, oh, I knew those two places, but this one, she goes, yeah, I'm really going to need it here. And I'm usually surprised by one of the areas of reduction. Then there's usually an area or two that I want to reduce. And she says, no, there's no need to do that. And it goes to point out that until you've made veneers for maybe many years of your career, 
um, you really don't or we really don't have a great understanding of exactly where the technician or our particular technician that we work with would like some extra room. And so whether you work with us or another laboratory, my suggestion is when you get into no prep or even better minimal prep veneers, is to send that study model off to your technician. Let them show you where they want it reduced. And there, you're only going to reduce that the areas where they feel are critical to get good aesthetic result without going in and just kind of going all eight teeth or whatever, going in and reducing a half millimeter because you heard that was a good way to do it. So whether it's us or your lab, give your technician the ability to help drive that treatment plan by having them look at it. Oftentimes, if not all the time, then I'll have them do a diagnostic wax up for us, which we'll show to the patient and we show it to them and they like how it looks. We'll often make a putty wash matrix of that and you can see all this in that, the video um, that he was referring to. And then we'll put some Luxatemp bleach shade in there and lock it onto the patient's teeth for a couple minutes and take out the stent so they can get a preview of what the diagnostic wax up was showing them in their own mouth and get an idea of what it's gonna look like. And especially on patients who have big spaces between their teeth, when you close those spaces just temporarily with that Lexatemp, they are absolutely sold. They look in a mirror and they're like, oh, when can we do this? <laughs> and they're, yeah, they want to do it that day. Sure. They're bummed out when you say, you got to come back next week. We're really busy. Uh, it doesn't work as well on somebody who doesn't have those spaces. But on those additive type cases where people have multiple diastema, it's absolutely fantastic to show them the power. So thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, really appreciate that. Thank you for reaching out. And what does he win for being our YouTube comment of the week? Well, I mean, come on. What better than this autographed photo? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, good. this is you with the perfect smile. That is me with the perfect smile. And this is me with the hand flip saying, you've got to be kidding me. Oh, is that what that is? Yeah, that hand flip says, wow, what is going on? Do you on? do that a lot? Eh. Say, well, ah, just right there. You did it right there. Yeah. That's <laughs> when it comes in. That's when it gets used. I guess so. so That's better than last this. week where I appeared to be disgusting you and you appeared to be disgusted. Right. I'm not sure time. if this is a look of disgust or just bewilderment. But may, may I throw in something as well? Oh, okay, fine, sure. I'm going to throw in, it's going to say that it's a, a Bruxer adjustment and polishing kit, but keep in mind that because the particle size of Bruxer is roughly the same, it's smaller, but it's close enough to Emacs. Uh, that the burrs, the diamonds that are on here, and the polishing cups and wheels are going to work just as well um, for Emacs as they do for Bruxer. So it says Bruxer on it, but in the spirit of doing some Emacs veneers, which I hope you will. By the way, if you look at our veneer category, Empress veneers continue to shrink as Emacs veneers continue to grow. Also, if you look at our veneer category as a category, it's been shrinking since the recession in 2008. I'm not even sure we've seen the bottom yet. So if you're doing way less veneers now than you were six or seven years ago, you are not alone. Don't despair. The economy will come back. People will have more elective income for things mm -hmm. like that. We'll start to do more and more veneers. And the people who waited will benefit by having Emacs as the stronger material. So we'll get this kit out in the mail mm -hmm. to you as well, as well as the signed picture. Great. Any news? Yes. Well, here's a story that you may have heard on the news recently, the recent tainted water problem in West Virginia. Well, after about a week of no water, nearly two-thirds of the 300,000 affected people are still waiting for the okay to use their tap water again. Residents were unable to use their water to drink, bathe, or even brush their teeth after a chemical leaked into the water system. The only thing safe to do? Flush the toilet. Without safe water, schools and many businesses decided to temporarily shut down. Officials are looking into the cause of the spill and what they can do to avoid this catastrophe in the future. But it was just a part of West Virginia, right? Right. All right. But then, it, I mean, and it, I think it kind of went into, um, I believe there was a couple counties in Kentucky that um, were shut down too just as a precaution. And I know that they were worried about the um, Ohio River. Um, and so they've been testing that uh, just to be sure that nothing came into it right. or whatever, but it, it definitely affected a ton of people. Well, I've had three patients this week here in Newport Beach who haven't brushed for a week. They all said same thing, tainted water. They, like they thought it was West Virginia and Newport Beach. Not okay. But listen, here, I don't want to make this uh, desk my soapbox, but I am... I, when, I see, when I saw this story and I heard about it, of course, it's, you know, horrible and the people without water and that if it was myself, I'd be scared. But it's just there are millions of people who have no access to clean water around the world. Right. And they're bathing and cooking and drinking in the same water that animals are in. And so um, if I just, I'm a strong proponent of 
um, helping organizations that help to bring clean water to everyone because if we're freaking out as a country over 300,000 people, what about the millions who have no clean water, not one week, you know, just for for their lifetime. So. All right. Well, I don't want to take the desk that you turned into a soapbox, yep. turn it back into a desk, and then revert uh, it back to a right. soapbox. But one of the charities that I'm involved with through Pacific Dental is uh, Clean Water. Nice. And what they do is go down to Africa. And that's literally what they're doing is making wells uh -huh. for people down there. And you see some of the stories, and you're absolutely right. It's uh, amazing to see what happens when you bring fresh water to a community, not only for the people, for the health, for the agriculture, right. and for all that good stuff. And, you know, when you see, like here in California, the California Aqueduct, runs right next to the five freeway from uh -huh. northern california all yep. the way down here and you're just like you know that that just seems like it's really vulnerable right. just being out there in the open Absolutely. literally you could stop and pee in it you know if oh, you're yeah. on a long not me but you on a long road trip and didn't have a place to go or anybody could or right. dump anything in there or throw trash in there sure. and it makes you you know appreciate what a kind of fragile uh, asset it is mm -hmm. i'm just saying i know a lot of men who if they were told they couldn't brush their teeth for a week they would high five Right. And showering, I perhaps. mean, it really wouldn't be a problem. Right, exactly. But it's the drinking. Their lifestyles would not change. <laughs> right. <laughs> and they would drink beer. Okay. <laughs> They'd be very happy about the whole wow. thing. Anything else? Yes. If you have seen the award-winning film Blackfish, you are aware of the current controversy surrounding SeaWorld and the captivity of orca whales. Two doctors, both former SeaWorld killer whale trainers, who both had a role in the film, have come out to expose yet another negative consequence of captivity for orca whales irreversible tooth decay. Orcas have about 48 teeth, a set that has to last them a lifetime. The doctors say that infighting, aggression, and boredom in captive killer whales all contribute to broken and damaged teeth. The ex-trainer said that they even witnessed modified pulpotomies on the confined whales without anesthetic. The trainers had to irrigate the whale's teeth three times a day, a process they explained to guests as superior dental care. These drillings and the captivity of orca whales in general is a hot issue right now, generating a lot of controversy. Yeah, that's. I saw that movie. I As happened to see I. it. Uh, I didn't know. I didn't know anything about it. It just kind of popped up on on CNN. We watched it because we've gone whale watching up in in Canada a couple sure. times. And uh, yeah, to see the these proud. I mean, talk about top of the food chain to see these right. orca whales in captivity with the the fins that are kind of tilted over because they're not out where they mm. should be. I never really realized that there was a, a dental implications, but the sure. superior dental care um, sounds like a lot of the stuff that you hear marketed. And sure. I, and I kind of trust what I, you know, uh, the thought of doing uh, pulpotomies without anesthesia. I have no idea how to numb an orca's uh, molar, but right. I'm sure somebody knows how to sedate sure. the entire animal and be able to do it, which obviously seems... Uh, like a, a, a much you know e a much easier way for for the animal to be able to get through right, a process and more like humane. that. Totally humane, and um, you know it's surprising to me because I don't question even though two of the doctors are now in the film. I don't mm -hmm. question the motives of these people because when you hear them talk, they all got into this and wanted to be trainers mm -hmm. because they love these animals, right. were fascinated by these animals, wanted to be around these animals. It's not like they were paid an absolute ton of money. And it's kind of like I never question the motives when dentists are for fluoridation, mm -hmm. you know, and people, people are suspicious because dentists are for fluoridation. It's like, look, it's not helping us at all. Right. I mean, all it's doing, yeah, we're going we're gonna to do less fillings because of it, and it's on your kids because we all hate working on your kids. Right. You know, thank <laughs> God adults are still going to need crowns. But, yeah, <laughs> right. look, we don't want to work on your kids. You don't want your kids to have to have fillings done. Why would we be promoting fluoridation as a dental society if it wasn't in your best interest? But people get really suspicious. Mm -hmm. I wasn't suspicious at all when I when I saw these doctors um, uh, in the movie because I know they got into it because they love these animals. I just never knew that there were you know dental repercussions to go along with all the you know psychological repercussions and physical repercussions. Right, and I mean of course, and I I agree with you. I don't. I'm not suspicious of the doctors or anyone in the film. Um, just because, I mean, science backs it up. There's been research to show that, like, the difference between a whale in captivity and a whale in the wild, like, <laughs> I mean, it's night and day. You cannot argue with it. And so I know that it creates a lot of controversy, and it's a hot topic issue, and there's a lot of people who support um, these marine parks. Because um, it's not just SeaWorld. I mean, there's other places in Florida that have um, whales in captivity. And uh, But I, myself, am just... I. I'm just not okay with it. Just seeing how detrimental it is and then hearing now more even about their, their oral health. 
I just... I know, and it's funny. Producer James was saying that he told... He and his wife told their daughter, you know, how cruel SeaWorld is. Uh -huh. And she was just like, I want to go. I want right. to go. You know, I want to see Shamu. Because it's Shamu. And it's, it's cruel. It's cruel. I want to go. I want to see the whales. And right. so there, there is that kind of disconnect when you're younger about there's just this huge interest in seeing these giant mm -hmm. creatures. Uh, it's just probably not the right way to do it, to do it in confinement. You're right. probably going to have to get on a Zodiac boat and go pound through the waves, sure. you know, off the coast of uh, Victoria, like in British Columbia, to be, to be able to Which see them. So cool. uh, super convenient, though, and, and the way it's all marketed makes mm -hmm. it look like they're having so much fun as they jump up there and hit the right. ball. And it all started because that one trainer got killed, you uh -huh. know, in the movie, and that sure. started the whole investigation. So, yeah, hard to believe. Well, not hard to believe, but knowing that there's dental problems as well. Uh, I, know. I know. Unfortunate. Just one more thing for those uh, poor whales in captivity. Mm -hmm. Well, hate to end it on the bummer version Sorry. of CSL, but that'll about wrap it up for this edition. Uh, I want to thank everybody on the staff, everybody here at the lab. Thanks, Meg, for being a yeah. part of this, and I want to thank you for your continued commitment to quality dentistry. We'll see you next week. Ready? Okay, you're just sitting back, you're relaxing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> really get comfortable. Get a wide base. Hold on. Okay. There we go. All right. <laughs> I'm centered. Mm, okay. Thank you for that, Dr. D. Sure. Now, oh my gosh, you can't chirp or sure. Chirp. Chirp. Chirp and chirp. Well, we've got to get. <laughs> and I don't like McDonald's french fries, I'm sorry. People are. Oh, yeah, they're, they're limpy. You must not like. Thank you for that, Dr. D. Now, <laughs> sorry. There we go. No, I got this. It was just a very quiet, Ladies sincere nod. Who does bye bye? No. David Spade. Um, David Spade, thank you. Your brother. What? He looks a little like you. Well, I don't want to take the desk that you turned into a soapbox, yeah. turn it back into a desk, and then re-vert uh, it back to a right. soapbox, but...